Good afternoon to all of you. First of all, I want to thank all of the, uh, the members that are behind me today. I want to congratulate them as we have uh, just sworn in the first GOP supermajority. It's an historic day. Congratulations to all of you. And uh, this marks the end of one journey of the, uh, of the electoral process, and now it is time for us to begin the second part, the second phase, the most important part, and it's important to all Missourians, and that's of governing. And we take this, uh, we take this responsibility very seriously. Uh, we know that there are many issues and challenges facing Missourians, facing the citizens of the entire country. And the agenda, the broad-based agenda that I, I laid out uh, in the opening day speech, uh, in conjunction with the, uh, the, the very, uh, the very um, timely words of the Speaker Pro Tem as to the importance of the states, who the states have truly been the leaders in job creation, in lowering the tax burden, in innovation, in education, and in health care. It is, it is truly the states that will move forward and have uh, productive sessions over the next few years as the federal government continues to be largely log jammed and locked down and, and unable to govern. Uh, we have governed over the last many years. We've governed uh, when we have had Republicans in control of all uh, of the legislative uh, forms of government with the executive. We've governed when we've had divided government uh, with our Democratic Governor Jay Nixon. We have accomplished great things like balanced budgets, which has been the result of the work of the House. Uh, do not mistake that. It's been the work of the House uh, in conjunction with the Senate. It is the General Assembly that has provided those balanced budgets. It's the General Assembly that has helped keep uh, Missouri's AAA bond rating at a AAA status, much higher than the federal government's at this time. It's the General Assembly that has passed bills that have been uh, innovative in job creation and health care and education. And now we're going to look forward to what I believe is going to be two very productive years. I laid out the vision of the AAA agenda. Many of you have heard me describe this as I've traveled across this entire state of Missouri. Yes, it's bold. Yes, it's aggressive. But I know that this caucus is chomping at the bit and, and ready to get to, to work. I, I want to congratulate my colleagues in the Senate as well. I look very much forward to working with uh, Speaker Pro Tem Dempsey, with Majority Leader Richard, with all my other friends in the Senate on both sides of the aisle. Uh, I've had conversations with many of them already, Democrats and Republicans. Uh, Senator Jamila Nasheed, my good friend in the House, leaps to mind as someone I've had extended conversations already with uh, in the Senate on the Democratic side of the aisle. I've, I've met with many of my Democratic colleagues uh, here in the House. This is going to be uh, a, a bipartisan <laughs> agenda that I believe Missourians will embrace of economic development for job creation, of looking for a strong energy policy for a more energy independent Missouri, uh, and education. Protecting the funding, as the House has, has definitely done, K-12 through and higher ed, against encroachment from other branches of government, and also looking towards common sense reforms, which we got a good start on last year. We had some, some progress. Uh, I, I appreciate the progress. I appreciate the support of my caucus on an issue that's near and dear to my heart, and we'll continue to move forward uh, in that way. We're going to be looking to, to create jobs as, as best we can. Government will not create them. But the government will look what it can do to, to facilitate that and to remove uh, barriers to innovation uh, and reform. Uh, I'm happy to uh, address any questions at this time. Speaker Jones, um, I've talked in your, about uh, education, but you weren't very specific about what you intend to do on teachers and education reform. Are we going to be seeing um, growth similar to that? Which, um, seem last, last year to be stuck in the caucus? Is there, is there more agreement on those issues this year? Well, the caucus made incremental, inc did, did make positive incremental progress in the area of, of looking at uh, teacher accountability, looking at evaluations, looking at reforming an extremely antiquated system. I, I, I really have a tough time thinking of any other industry that, that, that cripples its, its, its employees uh, other than the way that the, uh, the, the bureaucratic teachers unions have done over the last several decades. You know, we've, we've, we've seen billions of extra dollars flow into that system. And if money was the answer to education, we should be, you know, leading the nation and leading the world in education. We are not. 
Test scores have largely flatlined and progress has been stalled. So I believe, yes, Rudy, I believe we will start with some of the constructs of the bill that we successfully passed out of the House last year and uh, looking at, at putting innovation and reform into the, into the teacher tenure system, merit pay accountability, all options are gonna be on the table. Uh, we're gonna be releasing committees. Uh, uh, we plan to do that before the end of this week and uh, that's to allow committees to start working next week. Uh, Senator Dempsey has talked extensively about uh, possibly pursuing some sort of tax cut, and there's a multitude of ideas in the Senate. What is kind of the House's feeling about cutting taxes, and would it be paired with get rid of, getting rid of exemptions or anything like that? What, what's going to be taken on that? So I think Senator Dempsey and many of his colleagues' plans dovetail very nicely with the House. Uh, I, I have uh, found that uh, Senator Lamping has a really good handle on many of these tax policy reform issues, and he's already pre-filed a bill I've taken a look at. I think you're going to find a lot of interest in that in the House and perhaps even a, a companion bill in the House that mirrors a lot of those concepts. And, you know, I think we have to start with the premise that the, the, uh, the only way to raise revenue is not through tax increases. And, and I think to, to think that that is, that is the only presumption, that the only way we can increase revenue in the state is by tax increases is, is largely naive about, about economics in general. Year to date, year to year, last year to this year, tax revenue in this state has increased, and some would argue it based upon where we have been, it's increased significantly. <coughs> I would like to remind you all we haven't raised a single tax in the state, we've actually cut them. So pro-jobs, pro-growth policies is what ultimately helps increase revenue the most. So the Missouri House has always been willing to lower the tax burden on Missouri's families and small businesses and farmers, and if there's ways to do that, and, uh, and, and, look at, and, and also look at redirecting revenue. I think the government's job is to spend the money in the right way. I think our budget committee will still be looking at waste, fraud, and abuse in the system and will come up with more money with this increased revenue that will be part of the whole economic picture. In your uh, address, you mentioned tax credits specifically. You wanted to potentially reduce or get rid of wasteful <coughs> ones, but you wanted to keep beneficial ones. What are some tax credits that you want to take a particularly hard look at? Well, I would, uh, I would direct everyone to look at the, the bill that the House passed in the special session of, uh, I believe it was 2011? 2011. In, the, in, in 2011, the House passed a very comprehensive tax credit reform bill that eliminated, I believe, 20-plus tax credit programs. It had savings of millions of dollars. There was a lowering of the caps on some of our largest programs. We worked with uh, Budget Chairman uh, Sylvie and, and Vice Chairman, now Budget Chairman Stream at the time, and they told me that that did give a lot more budget certainty, true savings in the millions of dollars over the long term, and I think that is, is a proposal that we would look. Now, is it going to be exactly the same as that? No, but I would just point to history as to what the House is willing to do in that area. And as I mentioned in my speech, it's about cutting, it's about capping, and it's about creating. With the Lieutenant Governor's Office, do you see him a need to clarify the, how a, a vacancy would be filled with the lieutenant governor? You know, Representative Smith has found the need to clarify that for five years now. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, maybe a little ironic or coincidental, but uh, uh, Representative uh, Smith, our, our new pro tem, has, I believe, pre-filed that piece of legislation. It has been a priority for the House since before we had this this year. And now when the uh, the folks who were critical of Representative Smith and their side, they all say, well, what is the need, what could possibly be the need for this legislation? We've answered we've answered that question now because the reality is, uh, as a, he, maybe he's clairvoyant, I don't know, but uh, <laughs> but but Jason knew that problems like this could come up, and so yes, there is a there is, it's arguable. Uh, I believe it should be elected position right now, but apparently the governor disagrees with that. So we're more than happy to clarify that in the statutes. I believe those bills have been pre-filed not only in the House. But I believe Senator Schaefer has pre-filed the same bill in the Senate. Speaker Jones. Sure I'm understanding you right. right now you're saying your, your understanding and your belief is that it would be a special election to fill a vacancy as the law is right Yes, now. and I actually backed that up with uh, one of my Democratic friends, Jane Duker, who wrote a very good legal – she's an attorney from St. Louis County. She wrote an excellent legal analysis where she agreed with my position on that and not the governor. But you get two lawyers in a room and a judge – and you're going to have to work things out. So uh, while, while different parties, and the governor is the governor for the next four years, so yeah, I believe his decision of an appointment is incorrect. So we as the lawmakers are going to clarify that situation uh, and make it 100% uh, uh, unmistakable.
Mr. Speaker, um, both you and Senator Dempsey are from the St. Louis area. I guess, can you talk a little bit about, uh, we were going back and looking at, it's been at least several decades that both of the chambers had leaders from the area. So I guess, can you talk just a little bit about that and how your priorities fit into the I, 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 uh, Thank you, Elizabeth. Yes, I think, uh, I think what it's going to do is you're going to see a renewed interest of, of cooperation between the House and the Senate. Uh, I will not sit here and tell you that every single bill that crosses the chambers will then suddenly become uh, law and put on the governor's desk. But what, what I would say is there's going to be there, there there's going to be common goals that we are both going to pursue together, and I think that's incredibly important. What is also important is is not only that we're from the same region, but that Senator Dempsey and I uh, have a long uh, friendship.